Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. We have a really cool guest with us today. His name is Dr. Peter. I can't quite say it properly. It's got a lot of it's got a lot of consonants and vowels in it. Uh, he sounds like he might be related to me. It's not. How do we say your name? Not Kwasniewski. How do you say it properly? Kwasniewski. Kwasniewski. Peter Kwasniewski is here with us. Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. You guys, he's a pretty serious guy. He's a Thomistic scholar and Aristotelian philosopher, a Benedictine oblate. But more than anything, he's a rocketeer. When we get back, we're going to uh, talk story with him about a little bit of that and then dig into his new book. It's a, the, the book is... The book is a, is a great book about the about uh, the importance of marriage. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak adventure. Kickstart that engine. Roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome back. My wife always loves for me to uh, start our conversation off with uh, the sign of the cross in Hawaiian. Me ka inoa o ka makua ke keiki a me ke uhana hemalele. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, Lord, supercharge this uh, conversation. Wake us up, Lord, to your truth and help us to live your truth. And we know more than anything, truth is a person, and that is the person of Jesus Christ, because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And <laughs> Peter, <laughs> Dr. Peter, amen. Dr. Peter, how do I say your last name again? Kwasniewski. Kwasniewski. But yes. you can call me yeah. Dr. K, as all of my students have done for a long, long time. Yeah. And don't feel uh, guilty about it. Well, you know, I'm Ukrainian. Uh, I, I, is that Polish or Ukrainian or what is your last I'm name? Polish. Yeah, so everyone always tells me I'm Polish. But I, I mean, I, you're, the sound when you make that, when you pronounce your name properly, that's a sound that I'm familiar with in my youth, you know, hearing that sort of uh, pronunciation. Slavic. Yeah. Oh, it's rich. I remember going to the Ukrainian Catholic Church as a young boy. And oh man, you know, in Wilton, North Dakota, where my dad was raised, and the deep coal mining voice of the Ukrainian men singing and the women singing, and and then hearing those those types of words and looking at the the missile, and it was all in weird letters that some couple of uh, <laughs> Catholic <laughs> guys, who were the two saints that developed the the Slavic. Um, Cyril and Methodius. Uh, yeah, Cyril and Methodius. Okay. Anyway, so, um, yeah, we're, we're glad to have you here, and we're going to talk a story uh, as we continue about your book. I love the way it's titled, Treasuring the Goods of Marriage. First of all, goods is such an important philosophical term. And in a throwaway society, it's something we need to know today. But uh, you're a father, uh, and, uh, and uh, how many children do you have again? My wife and I have two children, a son and a daughter. Um, we're very, very happy with uh, with the children the Lord has given us, <laughs> uh, even God. if we were expecting in a way to have more. But uh, God be praised for His providence. I love to I love to read your our bio. So you're you're a dad, you have two children, married, a uh, Thomistic scholar. Thank God for Thomas, man. He just makes everything make sense. And a choral composer. You taught at the International Theological Institute in Austria. How's that to have that in your bio? Isn't that pretty cool? And uh, and established the Wyoming Catholic College, uh, where you're a professor of multiple subjects, a prolific writer and lecturer. So we're so well, we're so glad to have you on our show. But I'm mostly excited because you're a rocketeer. Do you still do that with your son? We ha no, we haven't done that in recent years. But it was um it was a, a passionate hobby of mine when I was a boy. And then when he was a boy into his teenage years, we pursued it again. I took it up. We started it. Um, and we, we built hundreds of models. We hundreds? Built some really huge, wow. We built huge, huge rockets. Uh, we, we got into a level called high, uh, high power rocketry, um, which, if, you know, those who know anything about this, um, you know, these are the these are the sort of you know, large engines with rockets that look like something that could sit under an Air Force uh, airplane wing. Um, you know, that go thousands yes. of feet into the air. Have how many, how many feet? How many feet up in the air? Well, I mean, th thousands of feet. You know, it, we, if we had gone any further in the in the 
in the art or the science of rocketry, we would have ended up with the kind of rockets that can go nearly into the, you know, out of the Earth's atmosphere. I mean, not into outer space, but you, you know, might shoot down a Russian, you might you shoot down a Chinese <laughs> uh, spy balloon. You got to be careful. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, we could have easily hit the Chinese spy balloon. Really? No, no, no yeah, yeah. kidding. And did you? So, at, uh, that, so, mm, at that time, did you guys were you able to put GoPro cameras on it or anything like that to see what was? Oh going yeah, on? we had all we have all kinds of video footage of our flights. In fact, I, I'll just throw this out because you're the first person I've ever talked to who's asked me about my rocketry past. Uh, we all have a past, you know, my past. I don't want to talk about my past, but go ahead. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but if you go to my YouTube channel, the very first video I ever put up a long time ago, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, that's a long time in YouTube terms, is a, is a about a 10 minute video with highlights from all kinds of uh, rocketry launches and gopro cameras and all kinds of stuff so and so that's your number one that's your number one video i bet too well it was the first it's not the number one <laughs> so. so so okay i'm gonna try it again peter kwasnevsky yes okay good that's our that's our guest today okay so now i don't care about all of that stuff tell me about the wipeouts the crashes like when we when we when we film surf move okay. film and i'll be having this great wave all people care about is the wipeout so what yeah, was, no, was, no, I can tell you we had some massive, we had some disasters. <laughs> uh, there was one, we built a cluster rocket at one point. It was uh, modeled after a Saab uh, missile. Uh, so we, we often took our designs from real military missiles. Um, so we built this large, you know, let's say five foot tall, uh, maybe even six foot tall rocket about, you know, that, that wide. And it had... Um, six engines in a, in a circle about, so it was, about, it was called a cluster about. rocket because you had to you had to ignite them all at the same time yeah okay? uh, and oh. it had separate oh. plugs for all of these different engines with the cables going back to the detonator um and we and we had invited we had we had built it we or we had a disaster earlier when it launched successfully but the parachute didn't deploy so it crashed we rebuilt it and then we invited all of our friends so there were dozens of people kids adults all watching on this beautiful Wyoming day, waiting for this successful launch of this of this cluster rocket, the second launch. And we, you know, we did the countdown, got to got to the ignition, and then the whole thing just blew up in this huge ball of flame. You know, all the engines malfunctioned. The thing just was a charred wreck, uh, and there was a sort of you know uh, uh, people gasping, and then some embarrassed laughter, and then that was the end of that launch so <laughs> but you know what that's the one they'll remember if you had launched it they wouldn't they would probably hardly remember it today <laughs> oh goodness did you do did you actually do a countdown did you actually do a countdown did you actually do the countdown oh yeah yeah of course yeah, Ten, yeah, no, nine, eight. you know i lived in uh when we were filming long ride home on the mainland uh, i lived in the coco beach area for a while so right off in front of my condo on the beach i could look and see their rocket launch and wow. i was one of those kids that would get up early in the morning during the Walter Cronkite days and watch the launches. I watched every single one. I would get up at 2 a.m. and watch all of the stuff and then delay, 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 and then the school bus would come, you know, and I never would see. But but um, it, it was really interesting to listen to the countdown on the on your iPhone, you know. They, they would go, I would go like, um, I don't know, ignition check, downrange check, uh, check, 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 and then, uh, and then permission to launch, and then there, there would be the countdown. And, uh, mm -hmm. I, but, th but there's an interesting, um, Thing. I, th I don't know it's kind of a different it's a segue in a bit but there's a have you ever heard Carmen's song the champion no oh it's a cool afraid. song it's about it's about Jesus Christ taking on Satan uh, staging a big fight and it goes you know talk you know it taught two boxers in the ring and how God the Father is the the referee and uh, the demons are all there squealing and screaming and and the fight is going on and Jesus blocks every blow you know like the t temptations at the you know during the during his 40-day fast and and but then at the very end he drops his hands and satan deals the death blow and he drops to the ground and everybody's just hushed the angels are silenced and then god the father you know has to do that 10 count but he did it the way you would do it he did it 10 9 8 7 6 5 Four. And the demons are going, oh, no, you're counting wrong. That's not the way you count. You're counting backwards. Two, one. And then Jesus comes back to life, you know, with the power and the glory, you know, of, of, of his resurrection. 
and and uh, the demons cry, oh no, and the angels cry, oh yes, he's the champion of the world. So, man, we've we've spent our whole first segment talking about rocketeering. Uh, tell, tell, let's just say, what's the name of your book? Where can they find you? We'll get back and we'll dig into the book. Yes, of course. So the book is called. Well, you'll see it. I don't know if you'll see it backwards here, but it's called Treasuring. You got it. The Goods of Marriage in a Throwaway Society, uh, published by Sophia Institute Press, your publisher as well as mine. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can get it from Sophia or from Amazon or any of the typical retailers. It's a great read, and I think it's really important. It's a really important book for this time in our in our history um, to to focus on marriage. When we get back, we're going to uh, we're going to get we're going to dig in. But I'm just going to read this quote from Pope Innocent the third, which is a thousand years ago, I think. By the teaching of sacred scripture, we learn that there are four kinds of marriage. The first is between a man and his lawful wife. The second is between Christ and the Holy Church. The third is between God and the just soul. Very Carmelite, you know, in his, in the writings. The, there. The fourth is between the Word and human nature. The Word with the capital W, Jesus. And these four kinds of marriage we discover with admiration and veneration alike something most dignified. Through the first, it is brought about that the two be in one flesh. Through the second, it is brought about that the two be in one body. Through the third, it is brought about that the two be in one spirit. And through the fourth, it is brought about that two be, two be in one person. We'll be right back with Dr. Peter Kwasniewski in his book, Treasuring the Goods of Marriage in a Throwaway Society. Now you can journey with other men on the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue through Bears Man Cave Community and our three-year school of manliness. Join at deepadventure.com. Better yet, you can lead your own sons through the same compelling video, audio, and written content. Can you imagine how much deeper your relationship with your dad could have been and how much more you could have learned and pitfalls you might have avoided if your dad had a tool like this to help to draw you both into a deeper, life-changing discussion. Now you have a trigger that you can pull that will take you into gritty discussions with other men and with your sons at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I want to invite our, our listeners to go to our YouTube channel, Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel, and you can watch this on, on video. If you go to our website, deepadventure.com, and subscribe to our newsletter, you get the video version of this radio show uh, that airs on EWTN on Saturday afternoons or evenings. You get that uh, in the morning, but you get the video version of it. So we invite you to check out uh, uh, our website, deepadventure.com, and subscribe to our newsletter. Our guest today is Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, his book is, I have to do that with my hand and my fist raised, Kwasniewski, like I'm conducting a, a, a symphony, which, by the way, our guest is a choral conductor and has written uh, a lot of liturgical music, so, and 
studied in Austria, kind of you kind of have to go there if you're going to be a, a composer, I think. So, um, so t the motivation for this book, uh, why do you call it treasuring the goods of marriage, and why do you call it a throwaway society? Yes, well, mm, the 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 traditional Catholic theology of marriage is is based on recognizing the positive goods that God uh, created in marriage, for marriage. Um, that is to say, when we want to understand anything in reality, we should look at what is the good, what is the good for it, and what is it good for. Um, and so with marriage, we're looking at uh, fides, proles, and sacramentum. Those are the, that's the classic three. Faith, fidelity, lifelong, the lifelong bond, uh, and the friendship that that, that, that allows and, and, and uh, fosters. Um, we're looking at offspring, uh, the children, uh, which is the, the primary good of marriage understood as a natural relationship. Oh, that's interesting. And, and it's called the yeah, primary, yeah. it's called the primary good? Uh, primary end. We can get into that if you, if you like. And then just yeah. the third one is the sacramentum. That is the, the sacramental bond, uh, that imitates the, the union of Christ and the church. Well, if you think about it, the children as the primary end, uh, it, it's, it's, it's the nature of love itself. Of love procreates. God the Father eternally begot His Son. It's, it is, and then, and then the Father, Son, and Holy, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, the, we were made. And, and man was called good, but, it was, but the Bible said it is not good. Everything was called good, and man was called very good, but then the Bible says it was not good for man mm -hmm. to be alone. So go, go into a little bit more about what the goods, I know you've highlighted them, but go a little bit deeper into what the goods are intended the intention yes. you know, in, in the in genesis you see god proclaiming and then he says this is why i intended it the intent intention of it tell us about go deeper with what the word good means first of all exactly well so so the the the, the good being uh is desirable and being as desirable is good that's what we mean by good being as desirable um now God is the infinite good. He's infinitely desirable. Um, he loves himself infinitely, and all creation has a natural love for him. And by his grace, man and the angels can have a supernatural love for God as mm. our supreme good. We find our good outside of ourselves. So that's the first key point. That's why it's not good for man to be alone. Man is created for God, first and foremost. That's the only one in whom his heart can be at rest in all, for all eternity. Mm. But it's also not good for man to be alone humanly and socially we are created as social and political and domestic animals you could say aristotle puts it that way yes. um, and yeah. so we need each other uh, we need each other we rely on each other to achieve our good our happiness in god um and we, we can't even you know we, we can do nothing without the help of others and that's also displayed by the by the vulnerability and helplessness of human beings when they enter into the world we enter into the world as helpless babies mm. have to be taken care of by our parents as we get older we, we continue to rely on our parents on our teachers on our friends on our colleagues where every no matter what you're thinking about in life there is a dependency on other people and the most intense form of dependency in human life is that between a man and a woman in marriage where they it's not just like two guys who are friends or two ladies who who, who are quilting together who, who are obviously helping each other but in marriage, there's a very specific kind of help, which is that they help each other to grow and to build a family and to raise that family. And only they can do it. Only a man and a woman who are committed mm -hmm. to each other for life can successfully help each other in doing precisely that good, which is the good of perpetuating the human race uh, and introducing, as, pa as Pius XI says, introducing new members uh, into the kingdom of God. That's the greatest dignity of marriage. Not that we're merely bringing more uh, boys and girls in the world, which is glorious in and of itself, but we are, because of Christ, because of his um, revelation, we are able to bring citizens into heaven. Um, and, you know, there's even a tradition that that uh, the reason why, uh, you know, God created human beings is to fill all the places in heaven from which the angels fell. The, the, oh, the, the, my the, goodness, the, yeah. Well, you know... Uh, Aristotle talked about happiness, I think, as Aquinas did. People are always pursuing happiness, but they will never really have that happiness unless they pursue the true good. 
that God intended, not not for them as a human, as for them as a man or a woman, but actually even specifically for them for their own telos. God prevent. God wants us to be happy, but we exactly. can't find that in a disordered way. We need to do that right. into pursuit into the pursuit of happiness. And I'll I'll tell you what I remember, uh, Peter. We're talking to Doctor Peter Kwasniewski, author of the book uh, the. Treasuring the goods of marriage in a throwaway society. I remember, Peter, when, when I was uh, a junior in high school taking a social studies class after lunch. And, you know, that great food they feed you, give you that coma, you know. But so I was drifting off in, in sort of a pondering. And suddenly I had this, this epiphany that one day I could bring a human being into the world. Uh, and a, a, a being that was going to live forever, hopefully with the Lord, and it changed. It rocked my world. It changed everything. I, I didn't go to didn't go to drinking parties. You know, I I got took three jobs so I could go to college. I, you know, it was all about for me being a dad because that's the true good that God had for me to bring in a mortal being. And now I understand why you say children are the primary good because the man and the woman already are alive, but for them together to bring a human life into the world and pe- men will come up to me and go you know i want to be on adventure i want to ride my motorcycles and surf and travel the world like you do jump out of planes but i got a family and i go dude that's the greatest adventure of all is to be a husband and a father yes yes well i mean you asked me earlier why i have in the title of my book um the phrase uh, throwaway society uh, and really what's so what's so distinctive of modernity of, of the modern world and this has been brewing for a long time is the loss of a hierarchy of goods, the loss of a sense of what the good things really are, mm. how they relate to each other, what's a what's a greater good, what's a lesser good, and that is because we've lost sight of God, the supreme good. He is the one who establishes the whole hierarchy of creation, of reality, and of all the goods, such that we can say, for example, although we should take care of the natural environment, you know, plants are more important than rocks, animals are more important or, or better, greater goods yes. than plants yeah. are human beings are greater goods than animals and plants and minerals right and so the 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 order of things has been lost sight of and that's why people once that happens people are completely awash in relativism and good becomes evil evil becomes good um you know they they attack marriage which is naturally good but then they promote abortion which is naturally evil and and as as i discuss in the book even the pagan philosophers were able to see that the relationship between man and woman was natural, that procreation was good uh, and noble, and that something like abortion was evil. It, this doesn't require the Bible, even. But you're confusing right? me a lot, uh, Dr. Peter, because I don't even know what a man and woman is. You know, when, they, when someone says, I can I can identify as a woman, and then you ask them, well, what is a woman? And they look there at you blank-faced, you know. I mean, they're, 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 this book is vital, I think, for that reason. Uh, be, you know, I think John Paul II's writings on uh, the, 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 the 135 homilies on the, on the theology of the body, what a timely thing. Um, we got a few, a few moments for want to break away. What do you, what do you say about the, all this gender confusion and the true good that 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 God has for yes. us? Yeah, it's 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 because um, really ever since Descartes, there's been uh, a split in Western thought between yeah. man's mind, his ego, his self, and his body, and the body becomes seen as manipula- manipulable matter, almost like real estate that you own, you can do with it whatever you wish. This is a false view of man. It's a false anthropology. John Paul II wow. was excellent at refuting it. Wow. Um, and I think that only the Catholic Church possesses the key to making sense out of our experience of human life, our bodily life, our, our the life, our unified life, which yes. is which is that of a of a soul together with a body. Not a soul in a body. Not a, a you know a, a soul and a body. It, it's one. We're talking with Doctor Doctor Peter. Kozniewski, I'm so proud I can pronounce your name I pro- most properly. And we're a Benedictine oblate like myself and an and a, and a author with Sophia like myself. So we're kind of Ohana, uh, treasuring the goods of marriage in a throwaway society. We'll be right back with more th- with Peter. This is Dan LaBoon Markham with another episode of Country Up. 
broken places. Jesus calls us to all look for broken people and broken places, because he did. And that means Christians must be a people of what the Old Testament calls shalom, that is, peacemakers. In the Bible, shalom is more than bringing a ceasefire to warn people. Shalom means to bring complete wholeness, well-being, and harmony into all situations in life. Called to places where things are busted up to bring shalom is a serious assignment. Some folks are afeard of broken places, like at the gospel mission where I minister from time to time. Some folks often run away from brokenness, like those with uh, physical disabilities, mental illnesses, or addictions. Yep, hard stuff, partner. We learn in chapter 3 of Genesis that sin brought about brokenness within ourselves and our relationship with God, brokenness between each other, and with our environment. Yep. As his people of Shalom, we are called to reflect him by bringing wholeness to broken people, places, and things. And we've got a mighty fine toolkit when we stop and take an inventory, like a shovel to dig out another's car stuck in the mud, repentance and forgiveness to make things right, compassion that remains bedside a person on his or her deathbed, saw and hammer to build a ramp for a wheelchair-bound neighbor, sharing the love and the saving grace of Christ with a sinful, bound-up soul. But it takes more than inventory in our toolkit. Got to have, number one, a desire to look for brokenness, a number two, a willingness to respond to such things, and number three, the commitment to see things through, turning brokenness into wholeness. Blessed are the peacemakers. As such, Jesus said we would prove we are God's daughters and sons. This is Daniel LeBoon Markham at countryup.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. We invite our mama bears to join with us at deepadventure.com. You'll have access to all of the Long Ride Home TV shows even before they air on EWTN. Plus, three years of the shareable Ocean Sunrise daily catechism videos. Plus, at deepadventure.com, a 20% discount at our online store with all of our great t-shirts and clothes and books and rosaries and medals and all kinds of accessories. You'll also get an autographed copy of Bear's latest book and for a limited time, a Catholic biker stuffed teddy bear. All at deepadventure.com. Come on, Mama Bears, let's hear you roar. Did you know that each Saturday morning you can receive the shareable YouTube video version of the Bear Wozniak adventure in our inspiring weekly newsletter, even before it airs on the radio or hits the podcast apps? Never miss another episode. You can even binge watch Bear's inspiring guests. Think about the impact you can have sharing these videos with your friends. Go to deepadventure.com and click the subscribe button. Be the kind of man that when he gets out of bed in the morning, the devil says, oh no, he's up. Go to deepadventure.com and invite Bear to speak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. You know, the the human body... um, it, it's a phenomenal thing, isn't it, that, that Jesus said, God said he made us in his image and likeness. And we're not very much like him in some ways because of our fallen nature, but we are in his image because we have a spiritual, rational soul that God infuses from the moment of conception. A man and a woman make the human body, but God joins in that nuptial union and creates a unique spiritual, rational soul. But I love this one chapter heading you have, is the human body part of the image of God? That's an important question. Yes. The, um, so in this, in this book, I do take up some of the insights of John Paul II, which really, when you look at them, when you look at them carefully, John Paul II is simply elaborating on themes that you can already find in Aquinas and Aristotle. So St. So John Paul II here is quite a traditional thinker. He's in that tradition that goes back so many centuries. Um, but what what St. Thomas says and John Paul II is that strictly speaking, the image and likeness of God are in the human soul. They're in that rational intellectual uh, soul that you just mentioned. Um, what does that mean? Well, God is spirit. 
He is he is pure intellect. He's he's wisdom. He's love. He's a spiritual uh, entity. Um, and I'm talking about God in Himself. I'm not talking about the incarnation yet. Uh, and so the angels who are pure spirits and man who is a spiritual being, even though he's also a bodily being, um, we are like him because we too are intelligent and we are capable of loving. Um, we can know the truth. We can love the good. We can rejoice in the beautiful. This uh, in company with the angels is what gives us the image of God. It's what makes us in the image of God. When we are more and more like God by his grace, that's what the tradition means by likeness. So image means our rational nature, which we can never lose. We're always, we always have that dignity. But likeness refers to our greater and greater assimilation to God, being like him more and more by grace. Uh, and, and, and that's something that we can gain or lose, right? So this is just, I just mentioned this because sometimes people get confused about human dignity, where it comes from. Mm. There's a dignity we have because the image of God is in our nature. No one can ever lose that. Even the worst criminal can never lose that. So, a, so angels, angels are not um, made in God's image. No, they are. I just, I said they were. Yeah. Um, I just I clarify. I'm sorry. Angels. Yeah. But, but all men are created in the image of God, and they can never lose that image because they always have reason and free will. Mm. But the likeness that can, the, the dignity that consists in our likeness to God by grace as His sons. That can be lost, and so we can lose that dignity. Mm -hmm. right? I'm just making that distinction because people sometimes get very confused mm -hmm. about what dignity means. And then, but here, I, 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 thanks for clarifying what I was, what I was uh, about the angels. You know, uh, but then it says that we uh, that we will judge the angels. I imagine that would be the fallen angels. But but mm. uh, but we we will. Um, what makes us unique from the angels is that we have uh well you know the early church fathers some of them called us amphibians because we were spiritual uh, you know we're heavenly and we're earthly we kind of live in both realms and uh, because of the salvation of the work with jesus christ becoming man uh, while remaining all god we can become children of god and are even divinized which is, is something that even the highest angel uh it, it doesn't have that dignity it's an amazing thing so what you could say is that, uh, and, and thank you for pushing further on this, um, although the image and likeness is in the soul as it is in the angel, nevertheless, the human body reflects the dignity of the soul. Our body was made for our soul. And St. Thomas even says that the body is a certain overflowing or fullness of mm -hmm. the soul. The body basically gives us the equipment that our soul needs in order to live a properly human life. We can't, we can't actually do much <laughs> without our, we can't do anything naturally speaking, without mm -hmm. our bodies. Mm -hmm. um, our bodies, as I said before, it's not just a piece of real estate. It's actually part and parcel mm. of who I am, which is why if you hit me on the cheek, I don't say, why did you strike my cheek? I say, why did you strike me? Because my mm -hmm. cheek is me. You know, it's part of mm. me and it's part of mm. who I am. Um, but of course, the the, uh, the incarnation uh, radically changes also how we relate to God because now God has become a man without ceasing to be God. He's become man, he's taken on flesh, and he has made the flesh the hinge of salvation. That's mm. a phrase from Tertullian, the, mm -hmm. the church father. So our salvation, so so important is the flesh to Christians that our salvation hinges on redemption in the flesh. Christ redeemed us in the flesh. He gives us his flesh and blood for our redemption, even now in the Holy Eucharist. Um, you know, the whole path of salvation is a path of virtuous life in the body and asceticism in the body. Um, and so it, it's one of the most absurd misconceptions is when people talk about Catholicism as a religion that hates the body or it's against the, the flesh or whatever. It's, the, it's exactly the opposite. It's, it's modern philosophy and modern culture that are totally, mm, they hate they the hate flesh. It. They, yeah. they hate our embodied dignity mm. and they are acting against it by chemicals by mm -hmm. potions by poisons by surgery by manipulation by by um uh, what's it called uh, mutilation right right these are these are body hating activities yeah and we think that we can change the mutability of our body you know to to mm -hmm. to as far as gender goes we could spend a lot of time going further than that but i want to ask you one more question about the human body and then i want to talk to you a little bit about love and sacrifice in John Paul II's writings. 
Um, you mentioned that the body is a liturgical. Um, I don't know how you said it, but the body is 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 meant to be a a, 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 a liturgical vessel. Vessel, exactly. yes. That that's a powerful statement. What do you mean by that? Yes. So, kind of building on what we were talking about before, um, the liturgy itself, such as the liturgy that God gave to the ancient Israelites, as well as the liturgy that Christ gave to His Church, and which has been developed under the influence of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. uh, for all of the centuries of the Church. Um, this liturgy is inherently a physical and material event. Mm -hmm. um, it obviously has a spiritual and transcendent aim. Uh, it's, me it's meant to infuse us with God's invisible grace and to unite us to, to him in spirit and in truth. But it takes place by means of, you know, bread and wine and water and oil and fire, all of these. And, you know, we use stone and, and wood, all these different materials that, go into our churches and into our worship. Um, and the human body itself is one of those material vessels, kind of like the vessel, the chalice on the altar. Mm -hmm. The human body, too, is supposed to hold, first of all, our soul, um, but secondly, the grace of God and even our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and so the human body becomes a tabernacle of the divine presence. Mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. and so the ultimate dignity, the highest dignity of the human body is not just to be uh, a co-principle with the soul in performing various activities of life, but to be a vessel of the presence of the Most High. Um, and that is what the resurrected body is going to be par excellence. You know, and forever and ever, the resurrected body will be that chalice that holds you know, in itself the precious content of God's grace and the beatific vision. And we will surf in heaven, maybe. It's there, possible. There's going to be Christ good, sir. Anything, there's going <laughs> to yeah, and there'll be music. No, but you, th you think about even our in an, even in the mass and the liturgy, the body. We we kneel, we stand, we cross ourselves, we hold hands, we raise our hands a little bit. Um, you know, we do those those Catholic calisthenics, but we're the, our physical body is worshiping too, not just our spiritual soul. I want to ask you a question, uh, just kind of get going before we our next break. But uh, John Paul II wrote his first writing i believe was called love and responsibility and it kind of i wonder if that goes along with your your title of your first chapter love and sacrifice yes that that's yes, everyone sure. that, that's a big title yes um yeah i mean of course as as a bishop uh carol Wojtyla, uh in poland he worked with so many couples young people older people and he says it's very interesting in love and responsibility in the preface um, he says, you know, sometimes people object, uh, why are Catholic priests and bishops teaching about marriage and family? They're not married. What could they possibly know? What could they possibly understand? And he, he takes that head on and says, actually, we know a lot more than people realize because we talk to everybody. We talk to hundreds of, we, first of all, we're in from the families. In the we confessional, grew, right? Yeah. Yes. We've grown up in families. We talk to, we hear people in confession going through every possible crisis and difficulty. Yeah. We counsel, yeah. we're counselors, we're spiritual directors. We are, in a certain sense, uh, we're like the control tower that's getting all the information from all over the place. And it gives us a perspective that no one else has on marriage. And I think that's true, and that's been my experience with the the best priests and bishops I've worked with. They have God gives them a very deep insight into marriage and family. How is that possible? It is possible because all states of life and vocations are based on love and sacrifice. We'll come, we're talking um, with Doctor. We're talking with Doctor Peter Kuznevsky, whose book "Treasuring the Goods of Marriage in a Throwaway Society." We'll dig into that more when we come back with the Bear Wozniak adventure. People love our EWTN TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. Thanks to you, the show has won four different Tally Awards. And now, instead of waiting each week for the next episode to air, you can actually binge watch our show and even share it with your friends when you go to deepadventure.com and join the Mama Bears or the Man Cave. Along with all the other benefits, you get total access to all the seasons of our aired episodes, plus instant access to episodes that won't even air for several months. Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak, a great way to communicate the gospel in a gritty enough way that even tough men will stop and watch at deepadventure.com.
Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. When you go to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel, you get access to all of our free playlists, including hundreds of episodes of the Bear Wozniak adventure, plus the three-year journey through the whole catechism in our Ocean Sunrise Catechism series. And you even get short clips and live streaming of Baron Cindy's Adventures in Paradise videos. Go to YouTube and subscribe to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure channel. Are you still listening? I thought we warned you to change to an easy listening station. Well, you asked for it. Here is more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha, welcome back. I got to remind you guys, my book, uh, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone, is ready right now. You can go to Amazon.com and, and order it or go to Sophia. Uh, great. It's, a, it's, a, it, it's very gritty. It's something that men can read. Uh, they can read with their sons, but women love it too because it really helps you define what a, what a, what a man is. And women, single women that want to have a great way to communicate with their sons. It's a great way to, to read through those chapters with, with, with your sons. And I think with, with the rest of the, say, confirmation or age older children. I also want to invite you to go to deepadventure.com and m women, join, mo join the mama bears. Uh, you get uh, 12 months curriculum on the virtues and you get access to all the, all the episodes of Long Ride Home. We, we just sent the Hawaii uh, episodes to EWTN. It's going to start airing September 1, Long Ride Home. Uh, season four filmed in Hawaii, uh, riding motorcycles here, and uh, and so you can when you when you join the Mama Bears, you get all thirty three of those episodes, the YouTube version of them, so you can get your brother in law to sit down and watch a few of them, kind of get them hooked on on what it means to to be men, and also uh, for the men. Go to deepadventure.com. Join the Man Cave. It's a non-Facebook community. We, we share with each other on an ongoing basis what's going on in our lives. And then once a month, we get together for a Zoom big Zoom call. And then there's the, a three-year curriculum on what manliness is, the School of Manliness, similar to the School of the Prophets, similar to what happened in the Cave of Adullam with, with King David and his band of misfits who became the Mighty Men of Valor through, the, through helping uh, form each other and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the school of manliness is something that we go through together. Uh, wherever we happen to be, whatever chapter we're on when you join, that's where you jump in. And then you, though, men, uh, there's audio, there's video, there's written, there's assessments. Take this curriculum. Take your sons through this curriculum. And instead of saying, hey, what did you do at school today? And they go, oh, nothing. You've got something real vital to talk about and, and develop in them manliness. Not masculinity, just flat-out manliness. Dr. Peter... Kwasniewski is here with us, the author of the new book by Sophia. Um, I'll show it to you. Treasuring the Goods of Marriage in a Throwaway Society. You know, in my book, I talk about, uh, Peter, I talk about, uh, I, I like to quote Louis L'Amour Western. Do you see all my books behind me, my early church fathers? Yes. But right over here on the side is 105 of these leather-bound Louis L'Amour Westerns. I'm a big Louis L'Amour fan. Uh, yes. All of his men were virtuous, and the women were powerful, and it was it's just a great book, I think, for... Uh, people to read, but in, in there he talked. He, there's a quote. I think John Wayne used it in one of the movies that he wrote. Uh, that um, that it, it's it, hmm, I can paraphrase it. I guess it, what makes a boy a man is taking on responsibility. And in the world mm -hmm. today, we see a lot of man boys. Saint Thomas, to, to kind of paraphrase him, his definition of a effeminate man was a man that just seeks pleasure and, and ignores responsibility. And then here's your yeah. chapter: love and sacrifice. They're the same thing, and they, they go hand in hand. With, without love, isn't a, love isn't God didn't say I so the Bible didn't say I so love the world that I felt all gushy inside, and you know, he he, he gave his son. It it was action. It was gritty. Yes, exactly. Well, so so love. Let's just start there. Love means willing the good of another. That is the classic definition of love, um, and it's a wonderful definition of love because 
although it it includes emotion and feeling, um, we're not supposed to be indifferent or cold or pitiless or unmoved or immovable, but it, it places the emphasis on something objective, which is that we will the good for another. Love means looking out for the good of another, taking steps to achieve or protect the good of another, right? Um, and why? Beca it goes back to what you, you what just we said about action. You said it involves action. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and going back to what we said earlier, you know, human beings need each other. Um, they need each other to protect and to promote one another's good. That's what friendship is all about. Friendship of virtue, the highest form of friendship, but also friendship of, of pleasure and utility, which have a legitimate place and are part of friendship of virtue. Um, so love is to will the good of the other. And in our fallen condition, but also just because we're finite uh, human uh, creatures, um, that looking out for and promoting and protecting the good of another is going to require hard work and sacrifice on our part. It means at times putting our own interests second. It, it never means sinning against ourselves. We're supposed to love ourselves too, but it does mean putting the the the, the needs and and um, uh, of others first. And that's that a successful marriage. Everybody knows this is one in which each partner is continually looking out for the good of the other, Amen. right? In various yes. ways, yes. In, in little ways and in big ways. And if they're both doing that and they will fail, we're all going to fail. We're all sinners. We all need mercy and forgiveness. And I have a whole chapter. I have a big discussion of that in this book about the that marriage as a school of forgiveness and of mercy. It's, it's designed by God to be that way. Um, but, uh, you know, we're all going to fail. But if, if the spouses are sincerely looking out for each other's good as well as they can, you can see how that's going to strengthen the bond between them. It's going to strengthen their relationship. It's going to make them better parents um, and, and better spouses. So the whole God's plan for marriage and family, as the church teaches it, and as I dis discuss it in my book, it is so it is so beautiful. It is inspiring and it is um, consoling. And it guides us, even in difficult moments, in dark moments, we should we need to be informed with the wisdom of mm -hmm. Christ and his church mm -hmm. so that in difficult moments we can remind ourselves, what am I fighting for? What am I struggling for? What is the good of this? What is the point Amen. of this? Right? Amen. And it's not clever. It's simple. Yes. Usually it's quite simple. You know, what I like to do is I like, I like the quote from St. Thomas, love is willing the true good for the other slash St. John Paul II through self-donation mm -hmm. you know so, sure. so but the, in, in built into the word will is to say well if you will this you're going to act on it like when i pedaled yes. my bicycle across the united states that was an act of will that wasn't yes. a physical act at all that was just one pedal stroke at a time and so i want to so i want to dig into this area now manliness uh up until mm -hmm. i think the 40s all christians protestants and catholics were opposed to contraception and certainly abortion uh, yes. When it became easy, when, when contraception became easier, men would say to you to to the to the girl, "Oh, if you really love me, you'd have sex with me," you know. And and so and then in time with contraception and then the, the more and more abortion available, the women broke their social contract with each other and they acquiesced to the to the pressure of men men put on them. And that's not a man. I, actually, that's a man boy. That's a that's a boy seeking his his own pleasure and, and, and not taking on the sacrifice and responsibility of love. Yes. So when, when you when I see men, uh, I tell men, you know, men, boys used to say, oh, that girl. She makes out, but she doesn't put out, you know, like she's a tease. Men are the biggest mm -hmm. teases of all. They'll get into a relationship with a girl, never ask, never ask him to marry him, never commit to having a family. Men yes. need to grow up. Can exactly. you talk to us about yeah, that? What you're describing is uh, not only is it a man boy uh, and an effeminate who is seeking pleasure, but what you're describing is a manipulator and an abuser, mm. right? Yes. Um, we, we, we nowadays are, we are rightly... Uh, desirous of overcoming the clerical abuse crisis and all different forms in which child abuse takes place. But we also have to recognize that adults abuse each other on a regular basis. And that's the, that is the original, you might say, form of sexual abuse is when a man treats a woman or a woman treats a man because it can go both ways as an object, as an object of pleasure to be used and discarded at will. Um, and the, the one night stand is the perfect, you know, model of that kind of 
uh, using somebody like a throwaway product, right? Hence, you know, again, with the throwaway society theme, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sub theme of the book, um, that is that is to treat a human being worse than we treat dogs. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, and and so I think I think that we should um, we we need to recognize how contraception in both obvious and subtle ways leads to the instrumentalization and manipulation uh, and taking advantage of, of the other party. Um, and that's why it is statistically speaking so connected with the breakdown in marriage. And, and, the, and society. And society The whole world general, is upside course, down as, because of that, yeah. As, as goes the family, so goes mm -hmm. society. That mm -hmm. was one of John Paul II's great themes. He, he, hammer, he hammered on that again and again. Um, and it's a theme that we need to remember in today's church because unfortunately there are a lot of people who are out there trying to deny uh, the, 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 the nature of marriage and the pivotal role of the family. We're talking with uh, Dr. Peter Kuznevsky, his book, Treasuring the Goods of Marriage in a Throwaway Society. Uh, you know, it's scholarly, but it's really uh, attainable. It's really easy to read. You've made it, you've made it both. And uh, so, you know, we uh, encourage people to go to uh, Amazon, go to Sophia and uh, acquire the book. Where can people find you, Peter? I have a website, peterkorshnevsky.com. If you misspell it, it doesn't matter because the search engines will still find it. Um, <laughs> you know, and uh, I have a composer website mm. called cantabodomino.com. I will sing to the Lord. Um, mm. I run a publishing company called Os Justi Press, O-S-J-U-S-T-I. That's got a website. There's lots of stuff going on. So. Yeah, isn't that cool how the Lord uh, blesses you? And, and it's not like, uh, he, he, there's, there, behold, I make all things new. He's always up to something new. Holy Spirit sometimes gives you a nudge, and sometimes he gives you a shove. You know what I mean? And you're just all of a sudden Indeed. off and running. Oh, yeah, I've, I have felt both the nudges and the shoves. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Peter, for joining us. Until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Thanks for listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Find more manly conversation at the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel. Subscribe and ring the bell.